Nicole and I had now been in Spain for over a month, and we were itching to explore a new country. France was on the horizon, figuratively and literally, as we were in Rabos, a small township in the heart of Catalonia, located nearly on the Spain-France border. We were camping in our tent for a week on the farm property of our two new friends, Catalan couple Alex and Marta. Alex and Marta were off the grid with water and solar and ran a CSA delivering locally grown produce to people in the area. We had two days left in Rabos, and Alex told us we had to see the ocean and beaches of Yensa, an important fishing port and tourist town on the border of the French frontier. Yensa was 20 kilometers away over mountainous, rugged terrain in the scorching summer sun of Catalonia. We made a power-packed breakfast of lentils and stir-fried veg and headed out into what was, for us, virgin territory among farms, ancient dirt roads, and unparalleled beauty. We felt like a couple of 17th century explorers, experiencing a new culture and a new country for the first time. Our cell phones didn't work and our only instructions were from Alex. He said, head southeast and follow the red-white. Always red-white. You see red-white? It is good. As a gardener whose dream is to have acreage of my own and grow 100% of my own food, I was energized to see so many edible trees and plants like grapevines, pomegranate hedges, apple trees, mulberry lined streets, and forests of olive. In between the farms and desert forest beauty, we stumbled upon the most beautiful offbeat villages we had ever seen. The landscape was raw and swallowed us up as we walked endlessly. The Catalonian sun poured down and showed us monasteries, past and present.
We followed the dirt trail for hours, trekking at a fast pace. We drank up all of our water and quickly realized we had to make it to Yensa and the ocean in order to escape the heat and hydrate. Then, like a mirage teasing us on the horizon, Yensa and the ocean just appeared. To say Nicole and I were tired was an understatement. We ate up some fruit and snacks, then let the cool waters of the Balearic Sea rejuvenate us. We even found some vegan gelato. Personally, I was sad we couldn't spend more time in Yensa, visiting each beach and historic site. The beaches were filled with topless girls, and the small city was rich with history. Sadly, we had to head back, since we were on foot, carrying our packs. There were no buses heading back to our village of Rabos, and we had a 20-kilometer return trek in front of us. We headed back, sunburned from the exposure, and salty from the sea. This was mentally and physically the most difficult two-day period of our adventure. Since we hiked 40 kilometers to Yensa and back, had dinner, then needed to wake up at 5 a.m. the next morning and walk 25 more kilometers to the town of Figueres, where our bus would be leaving at 9.30 in the morning, taking us into southern France. Okay, six in the morning. Mm -hmm. We got all of our stuff on us. Yep. In the Atlas packs. Oh, your pack looks really good. Thank you. Let me show everybody. It's Saturday. We left at 6 a.m. All of our stuff, and we're walking across two cities <laughs> on a trip that's gonna take us three hours and 30 minutes, covering like 20 kilometers with all of our stuff on us. Why? Because, why? To catch our bus in Figueres 
at 11.30 to go to Marseille, right. France. We got a great bus with only seven hour bus ride, great price. And uh, during the day, it arrives at a decent hour at like 4 p.m. Marseille time. <clears throat> yeah. Got a nice, beautiful and affordable Airbnb we're going to. Yeah. But the bus from Rabos, which takes 20 minutes by bus, wasn't gonna get to Figueres until 11.30 also. Yeah, so we're like, do we take that chance? What if the bus is running late? Yeah. It could be early, we don't know. And we kind of just didn't want to take that chance. Because if it's on time or one minute late, we miss our yeah. trek to Marseille. We have to wait nine hours for the next one. Then we have to miss Airbnb. We have to get their graveyard shift. Yeah. So. So we're taking our fate in our hands and we're going to walk all the way to Figueres for three and a half hours to make sure we get there by 930. Okay. <laughs> we are fucking crazy. <laughs> no. Wandering gardeners. Wandering gardeners. <laughs> Hopefully right. we just get picked up by somebody, so. You have a strong feeling we're gonna get a nice hitchhiker that's gonna... I do, actually. <laughs> drive us there. I'm just hoping. And just have hope. <laughs> we don't know what we're in for. We don't know if it's uphill. Yeah. Downhill. Yeah. This is our first uphill. Oh my god. Okay, let's go. <laughs> The yin and yang of this three and a half hour hiking marathon was rich with the beauty and opportunity of the natural landscape and the small farm villages which surrounded us rivaled by the punishing weight of our 50 pound packs and the heat of the sun creeping up on us with each passing hour. Fueled by the deep energy that only world travel can provide, we pushed our bodies to the limit and supported each other as we approached Figueres. Our Achilles tendons, hips, and feet were starting to fail us. But the unexpected and breathtaking sunflower fields gave us a second wind. We made the bus with 30 minutes to spare and welcomed the seven hour rest toward our first French city of Marseille.
Marseille was an intense city. The people we came across were strong and intense in personality and body. It was no surprise to me that the famous and intense kicking-centric martial arts style of Savat calls Marseille its birthplace. We checked into our Airbnb, made a garbanzo bean meal, and headed out into the city to get groceries and to see the sights. We also saw a few fights. Arrived in Marseille, France, southern France. Just got to our pretty cute looking Airbnb. Blue Sky Yoga Girl pulls out Miami fruit, freeze dried golden bears. What did you make us this morning? Made us some um, like guacamole, some toast, and coffee and bananas. <laughs> wow, looks so good. Very simple. Just jump out there as far as you can. You don't need to dive, but just jump. What, what is that? <laughs> my skin, I'm trying to even out my teeth. <laughs> you look great. Thank you. We leave. So they're friends. <laughs> we leave. Should we just swim out there to that um, lighthouse or should we go back? To our... I'm not swimming out there. Oh my gosh. There's like boats going by and <laughs> sailboats and people fishing. France! <laughs> <laughs>
two things loomed on our horizon. Our next wolfing project in northwest France and the city of Nicole's dreams, Paris. Say hi. Hey. Oh my god, your hair is so crazy. It's <laughs> ocean hair, so in the ocean. <laughs> Off the coast of France. Ooh, France. It's, it's so French. French. It's so French. <laughs> it's dinner. It's yeah, so dinner. French. We made one last vegan meal, got a workout, and hopped the train for the four-hour high-speed train ride to the city of light and the city of love. Nicole had been talking to me for months and months how one of her dreams was to travel to Paris and see the Eiffel Tower with her own eyes. We arrived at the main train station and I figured, let's live Nicole's dream on day one. Are you ready? I'm ready. <laughs> Named after the famous engineer and architect Gustav Eiffel, the Eiffel Tower was constructed from 1887 until 1889, and it's the most visited monument in the world, with about 7 million people climbing it each year. The tower is over a thousand feet tall and still the tallest structure in Paris. It was the tallest building in the world for over 40 years. Gustav Eiffel also built the framework for the Statue of Liberty in New York. Personally, I would highly recommend seeing the Eiffel Tower on your first day in Paris since it allows you to soak in unmatched 360 degree views of the entire city of Paris. We spent nearly eight hours around and inside the tower Nicole screamed with excitement when she caught her first view of the tower's tip rising from behind the Louvre. How are you doing? I would implore you not to use the elevator when visiting the Eiffel Tower. Instead, climb it. The ticket is less expensive for walking the stairs, there was no line, and it was a great workout. Half the fun for me of the tower was experiencing its brilliant engineering and inspiring construction as we climbed her steps. something about you today, what did I learn? I'm kind of afraid of heights. I know, why didn't I know that before? You went on other bridges, like in Vancouver, suspension bridges that were really high on the ground. It's not like I'm like terrified of heights, like I can deal with it. It's my own thing. So we're on the second observation deck, and you were taking some meditation breaths, climbing the stairs on the way up here, and now we're doing an elevator to the very, very top. Yeah. yeah. You're gonna make it? Yeah. Nicole asked me, 
How would I describe the countries and cities we have visited so far if I can only use one word? For Mexico, relaxed. For Canada, home. For the Netherlands, safe or maybe clean. For Portugal, free. For Galicia, magic. For Madrid, hustle. For Barcelona, sexy. For Marseille, tough. And for Paris, human. I can understand Paris's nickname as the City of Light, as to me, the city seemed like a city well designed and structured for the lives of modern humans. If you're a human being, you must visit Paris. Heading out. What did you think? I thought it was really incredible. It was historical.